Alison Seeley Smith here, the voice of Storm from X-Men the Animated Series and X-Men 97. I'm summoning you to a monumental gathering, the Uncanny Experience, the immersive X-Men fandom convention. This September 28th and 29th, we are transforming the Minneapolis Club in Minnesota into the hallowed halls of the Xavier Institute. Prepare for an electrifying array of panels, a mutant marketplace, celebrity meet and greets, a cosplay contest, the enigmatic Hellfire Club, and an unforgettable after-party in the mansion. Embrace your powers and let the storm guide you. Visit theuncannyexperience.com to learn more. Bum bum bottom, 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 bum bum bottom,
where the location of the building was. And now there's just like a mound. Yeah, yeah, and, and some trash. Yeah. There, there, there are some trash cans where the site was. But we weren't going there for something to see. I like the idea of going somewhere for something to feel. You mm -hmm, know what mm -hmm. I mean? 2024 and all of this buildup and celebration around the 40th anniversary of the Ninja Turtles has filled our hearts with so much love and so much reverence for these characters. And for us, there was just something to like, let's perform this reverence. Let's go to this place and really practice our gratitude. Like, it seems like really cheesy. It seems really, really corny. I, I mean, if you're listening to Comic Book Couples Counseling, you know we are pretty cheesy people. Uh, but we have been, for the last two years, spending a lot of time covering the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the podcast. We did four episodes covering four different eras of the Ninja Turtles. We did that panel at New York Comic Con last year uh, with Jeff Rowe and Kevin Eastman and the whole gang. We had a, another episode with Kevin Eastman. Uh, we talked to Eric Burnham about Saturday Morning Adventures. We did our 40th anniversary episode. So we've been spending a lot of time concentrating on what the turtles mean to us. And it's given us so much. And yeah, we laid down on a sidewalk, on a public sidewalk, next to a fake manhole cover, and we're freaking proud. And also, the people of Dover, like we had that, that dad and that son, yeah. see us get excited about it, and they were happy to see us, yeah. and they were very kind. And they, you know, he, the, the dad was eager to tell us what the building looked like. Yeah. You know, he, he remembered the building, and, and, and that was fun. And as we experienced in Graceland, and as we experienced in Bangor, Maine, we get some sort of, like, you know, like, I'm not like a super spiritual person, uh, but I, I can't think of another word. We get some sort of spiritual satisfaction about being in the place where something we loved was thought up and created and matured and being there in Dover and taking that weekend to write our first comic script. We talked about this a few weeks ago, but for the last month, Lisa and I have been noodling on an idea that will ultimately end up being a story that's going to appear in the anthology Pots and Panels. It's actually a comic cookbook anthology. So this story is food themed, it's recipe themed, and it's a memoir piece. And we've been talking about it for about a month, but now we had to knock out the script. We owed the editors and the artist the script on July 1st. Yeah, yeah, like within four days of our anniversary, which is, as we know, how all of the best comics are made. <laughs> Urgently. Uh, Sean Could Phillips? we have started sooner? <laughs> Sean, 100%. You can bring up Sean Phillips. Sean Phillips, Phillips and Jacob Phillips would say that is how the best comics are made as an emergency. <laughs> yeah, but the noodling part is work. Like, we had been... We had the story front of mind. We had been talking about it pretty much constantly. The only thing that we hadn't done was like put it on paper. And sometimes for me personally, that is like the scariest part. Well, that's why I thought it'd be such a great idea to lock ourselves yes. in a Holiday Inn, which is what we did, and bang it out. Because I was worried. We've never... I mean, obviously, for the last five years, we've been working creatively together through this podcast. Right. But we've never actually written a thing together. You've written stuff on your own. I've written stuff on my own. But this was the first time we were going to collaborate as writers. And I was nervous that it wouldn't work. Yeah. Uh, and, and what was great about locking ourselves into that Holiday Inn, and the way we did it is I actually stayed in the room and then Lisa went off to the lobby and Lisa would write her portion. I would write my portion. We would come back together, see how they fit together, do a little editing. And then we would go apart again. She would continue with her portion. I would continue with my portion. Yeah. And I thought it ultimately worked out extremely well. I'm so proud of the story that we created. Like every strategy, it may not work a second time. You know what I mean? Sure, like, so, sure. like, but for me, like my fear was we work very differently where Brad is like a spewer. He is an idea spewer. And so he likes to kind of like information download on the outside. And I am an internal person. So like getting too much information sometimes causes me to like 
shut down. Yeah. And so so having that assignment of like you execute this, I execute that, then we will do the idea of spewing and, and all of that stuff. Yeah, and, and we're gonna be talking about pots and panels a lot as we approach the launch of its Kickstarter, which is going to happen sometime in October. And I don't want to go too far into what our story is. Uh, I think that we will share the script to our patrons probably next week. Mm -hmm. uh, we did send it to our artist, Gerald Von Stoddard, for him to look at, and he was quite pleased with it. And that was such a relief. I mean, the most nervous we were were the days after we had returned from our vacation as our editor and as Gerald were reading that script and we were like, oh man, I hope they like it. I hope they like it. And they did. They did. They said some really lovely things about it. So now we feel confident, like, okay, we can let our patrons see it. And uh, again, as we approach the Kickstarter launch, we're going to be talking about it nonstop and you're going to hear a lot more about it. I think for now we can just say that the title of the story, Lisa, you, are you okay sure. revealing the title? We may have even already revealed the title. Yeah, we don't remember. I can't remember. remember. Uh, it's called The Vegetable and it speaks directly to an issue that I have. Yeah. Uh, but the story is told from Lisa's perspective about Brad's weird issue with the vegetable. One thing that I think makes our podcast work is we make it together, but I can be distinctly myself and you can be distinctly yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, yeah, we... we our product is us, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you can tell who's Brad and who's Lisa. Mm -hmm. And I think we kind of use that to our advantage in this story, yeah. like where it's just like, well, this is definitely what Lisa thinks, and right. this is definitely what Brad but thinks. the challenge of the story is it's told from your point of view. So yeah. all the captions are, are from me. Lisa's brain, yeah. you know? And, and there are captions that Brad wrote, <laughs> and Brad was very nervous to write. Yeah, but a lot of the pictures are going to be from your eyes, and yeah. you wrote a lot of those panel descriptions. Yeah, I mean it's a true it's a true collaboration. Yeah, it's a true collaboration, and uh, you know, like like we said, we were pretty nervous to collaborate together, and we finished that weekend, and we took a few breaks, and every time we took a break, we went and got coffee, or we went and got food, or we visited a comic book store, uh, but mostly what we did for our fifteenth wedding anniversary was write a comic together, and it was a dream come true. It really was, and I'm really shocked how easy it was and I'm making my peace with it'll never be that easy again what uh, do you think I, like I you know look I totally understand why you would do that you know you gotta manage your expectations <laughs> your fears all that stuff but I came away from writing that script going that is not the last script yeah. that Brad and Lisa write I need to write more comics with you. It's so funny because we've literally been talking about writing comics together since we were dating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it we've only done took it. us 15 17 years. years. Oh, all right, 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> to, to write one. And it it took outside pressure. Well, yeah. like it took someone from the outside going like, I believe you can write a comic. Yeah. And we're like, yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Please give us an assignment. But I also think like this conversation about collaboration and, and working together as husband and wife feeds really well into the rest of this episode, yeah. which is about a collaboration between a mom and a son. But if you are listening to this and you are a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan, Lisa and I really do encourage you to make the trip to Dover, New Hampshire. Check out, obviously, the, the monuments, the sites. Go to um, Geeked Out Comics. Buy some comics there. We certainly did. They had some great 50 cent spins there. Head over to Jetpack Comics, a really interesting store with a back room filled with all kinds of crazy goodies. Uh, dollar bins. Or actually, they're like $2 bins. Yeah. But good stuff there. We found DP7, which Kyle Starks had recently talked about in our Barfly episode. And then head to Northampton. Go look at Mirage Studios. Go look at the former site of the Words and Pictures Museum. Visit Newberry Comics. Go over to East Hampton, right next door, and visit Comics and More. That shop was incredible. We may very well just make the drive to spend more time at that shop specifically because that is like a, like a, okay, we have to take an afternoon and really truly dig. Yeah, I mean. Because things are not alphabetized. <laughs> I, it was like a Raiders of the Lost Ark situation, but we did find some dollar bones. Oh, yeah. We're on our way to completing our Jeff Smith run there of cartoon books. Uh, we picked up two more Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, comics. Lisa and I only need to get issue one. Issue three, issue four, and issue 15. Now, most likely we will never ever get a first print 
of Ninja Turtles 1, and we're okay with we're that. We're at peace with But it. we're very close to completing Volume 1 of Ninja Turtles, and it's pretty exciting. And we also saw a ton of cute main streets and tiny towns, and sometimes it's good to just, like, get out. Yeah. Just get out of your love nest and see the world. Yeah, yeah. We even went up to Portland, Maine. Uh, you know, we, we touched Maine a little bit. Yeah, and we were disappointed by Portland, Maine. <laughs> we <laughs> actually had a fight in Portland, Maine. <laughs> I was going to bring it up, but We yeah. have yet to make Portland, Maine fun. <laughs> if you are from Portland, Maine, and you know how to make it fun... <laughs> Uh, I mean, we have been there in the past and we have had fun in Portland, Lisa. They also have a really great comic book store, Casablanca Comics. Yeah, but we were fighting too hard no. to go to Casablanca yeah, we Comics. We didn't do that. We didn't do that. But we recovered from that fight on the way home. We are still married. Happy 15 years. So quickly moving on to Guilt Frame, the first issue of which is not going to come out for a while. It's arriving from Dark Horse Comics and Matt Kent's imprint of Flux House on August 7th. It's drawn by Matt. It's co-written with his mother. And it's one of those murder mysteries where the amateur crime busters are just as fascinating as the plot, if not mm -hmm. more so. Yeah. In Guilt Frame, it's an independently wealthy, quirky aunt and her 20-something orphaned nephew, and I cannot wait to spend infinite, infinite issues with these two. Yeah, I immediately related to the nephew because he loves Hawaiian shirts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I related with the aunt because when I see a Hawaiian shirt, it's just like, <laughs> I feel a little dismay. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's what we were fighting about in Portland, <laughs> that everyone. That is not what we were fighting about in Portland. <laughs> uh, it is a very cozy, sweet loving murder mystery that's also extremely violent when it needs to be, right? It's yeah. extremely compelling. It's very entertaining. It is a Matt Kent book, but there is that extra bit of Margie Craft Kent to make things interesting. I don't want to spoil the interview, but I love what Margie has to say about what Matt brings versus mm -hmm. what she brings, because it's literally just priorities. Mm -hmm. And when you have two creators with different priorities, I feel like it makes like a, a more rich story. Yeah, and, and that's our hope with our collaboration on The Vegetable, right? Right, like, right. Like, uh, we, we certainly related to that little moment in this chat. And we also don't want to spoil Guilt Frame itself because it's not coming out until August 7th. So the conversation you're about to hear is more about what it's like to collaborate as mother and son. It's so hooky for me. Like, I can't stop thinking about, like, having this conversation so soon after our Sean Phillips, Jacob Phillips yeah. conversation, because, of course, they're completely different people, and their parent-child collaboration is something that's really different. They are different. I mean, with Jacob Phillips and Sean Phillips, they've been collaborating for a good while now. They know what it's like to work together. But for Margie and Matt, this is a little bit of a new collaboration, although maybe not as new as I thought going into this conversation. But also their work is less compartmentalized, mm, where mm, Sean mm, goes and he draws the pictures and then he passes it on to Jacob and yeah. then Jacob does, and they both, you can tell by their conversation that they both work very differently. And um, Jacob can feel like maybe his dad doesn't fully appreciate his process yeah, or, yeah. or wants him to do it differently. Uh, yeah. Where I just love picturing Matt and Margie sitting together getting high on their ideas and putting them on paper. It's just like so compelling. Again, I think about what it was like for us in that Holiday Inn yeah. writing together. But we couldn't do the spitball <laughs> well, thing where I was just like, I can't think with you looking at me. That is true. That is true. And that is the difference between a mom and son working together and a husband and wife working together. I can't wait until the other side of this interview because I have so many yeah. things to say. Okay, well, let, let's get to it. We should also rip the Band-Aid off and disappoint our listeners right now because we have to reveal that Lisa could not be part of this conversation with Matt and Margie, and that stunk. Yes, I had to go on full vocal rest because over the weekend I had recorded a podcast and then took, like, way too many singing gigs and um, I just sang, I just, I oversang, and I learned a valuable lesson that just because you can physically be there does not mean that you're available. Yeah. And I just wanted to share that with you guys. 
You know, sometimes, especially if you're a freelance person, it's hard to not take a gig. Yeah, it's hard to say no to money. Right? Yeah, 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 especially when you feel like, oh, I'll never get money again. Yeah. But then um, there are emotional and physical limitations. And so I had to go on voice rest, but I'm totally fine now. This what was you a while ago. learned is that, yes, it's hard to say no to money, but if you don't say to no to money, then it will cost you money later because right, then, you had then to, I had to turn things down yeah, while I recovered. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was rough. It was rough, but thankfully you're okay. Yes. Physically you can continue to podcast. My voice is beautiful. <laughs> you can still sing, uh, but, but you aren't, in this conversation. And that's okay because we are going to have Matt and Margie back on the podcast once Guilt Frame is all wrapped so we can do a full spoilers conversation about these characters and these plots. And Lisa, if you're feeling up to it, if you feel like you can do a little singing, we need to get to our referrals. Sponsored by Omnibus. Omnibus is a modern digital comic book store and reader app carrying your favorite single issues, volumes, and omnibuses all day and date. Just like your local comic book store, you pay per book, but digital. Their focus is on building an excellent customer shopping and reading experience and using novel discovery features to help fans find their next new favorite book. They feature top tier content and already have many of the top publishers in comics today. So in the spirit of helping people find their next new favorite book, we have our referral segment. The idea is to give our counselees, that's you guys, further reading on the themes of the episode. Think of it as us sending you to specialists to further your healing journey through comic books. And Omnibus is available everywhere. Android, iPhone, if you just have a browser, you have access to Omnibus. Lisa, you went first last week. I'd like to go first this week. Sure. For my referral, I'm going with the image comic book series Hexagon Bridge from cartoonist Richard Brake. This is a science fiction story about a far future where a scientist has created a bridge between multiple dimensions. And this bridge is maintained by an artificial intelligence that may or may not be nefarious. And the reason I picked this book to pair with Guilt Frame is because a parental relationship is at its core. Uh, a husband and wife go into the bridge and become lost. And years later, their daughter daughter is on the hunt for them and she has special mental abilities. She's a little bit like a character out of a Stephen King novel, something like The Dead Zone or Firestarter, and these mental abilities allow her to like pinpoint where her parents are, but she can't do it alone. So she is paired with another artificial intelligence that can we trust it? Can we not? And the two of them enter the bridge to solve this mystery, Ooh. this riddle of her missing parents. Uh, Richard Brake is an astonishing cartoonist. This book looks incredible. It's available here on Omnibus. Take a look at the preview option. Just flip through a few of these pages and I think you'll be hooked. What, was I was I saying Richard Brake? Yes. Okay, no, Richard Blake. Richard Blake is the actor, Joe Chill from Batman Begins. <laughs> Richard Blake is the cartoonist who made Hexagon Bridge. Please don't send me your emails. Proper nouns are hard. They are. Okay, my turn. Yes. I decided to go in the cozy mystery direction. Love it. You mentioned in the intro that Guilt Frame is so charming and violent. Yes. And this book is the same. It is also under the grander umbrella of a Dark Horse comic. You're going to be able to guess it. Okay. okay. It's a very Lisa pick. Okay. It is the great British <laughs> bump off from John Allison yeah. and Max Saren. Uh, the team behind Giant Days, which I have still not read and yeah. feel actively guilty about. Same, same. We, we, <laughs> we do need to read Giant Days and we need to cover them on the podcast. But I have read Great British Bump Off and why would I not? Yeah, it's a great... I am a huge Great British Bake Off fan. I watch every, every season multiple times and I love me a cozy mystery. And this book is so charming. It I actually gave it to my best friend Amy for Christmas because I loved it so much. Yeah, I love this selection. Uh, and man, it really does pair well with Guilt Frame. It's funny. It's charming. The characters are interesting. It's kind of more cluey yeah. than Guilt Frame. Yeah, like the movie bit. Clue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I haven't seen. It's, a, you know, there's a little bit more like caricature, caricature stuff in it, but it's still really fun and really funny. And 
Um, it, it is told from the perspective of people who have also meditated long hours on the Great British Bake Off. Yeah, you did a review of that on Comics Bookcase, did you not? Did I? I, think I don't you think did. so. No, if, I think you did. Did I? I think you did. I mu- well. I remember editing it. That's okay, why. Okay, <laughs> well, I, I co-sign on my past self. It is so fun. You gave it a good review. <laughs> I'm feeling like I'm going to reread it very yeah, soon because yeah. I really like it. Same. Uh, that's a good idea. All right, Lisa, that's going to bring us to the end of our... I'm telling you, I'm 100%. I'm 100% recovered. But, you know, like talking about something, it makes you go like, maybe there is a little something. Oh, no. Referrals. And let's just get to our conversation with Matt and Margie Craft Kent right now. Matt and Margie, welcome to Comic Book Couples Counseling. Hello. Good morning. How's it going? Doing wonderful. Uh, I want to go back in time a bit. Uh, You know, in the press release, it talks about how the two of you used to have sort of like murder mystery games that you would play when Matt was young. Uh, How did that come about? And uh, how has that evolved into this comic book? Well, I I think uh, it it probably started because I had a lot of things to figure out myself, a lot of mysteries, like uh, what was Matt doing? What's he been up to? Uh, Or or how did did this gravel get on the the inside windowsill in his his bathroom? And uh, so I had a lot of mysteries to try and and, and figure out what, uh, uh, to figure out. uh, And that's how I knew that that, um, someone had opened the window and been out walking on the roof because there was gravel on, on the bathroom window. So, so you had to be kind of a detective, I think, uh, to be a, a mother to keep your children safe. You read between the lines there is that I couldn't get away with anything. <laughs> like you, it's, imagine having a parent that's also a human lie detector, you know, <laughs> it's just, uh, it, it, and, Go ahead. <laughs> and, and, and so and so then it just became fun to, to to create our own mysteries. And and we had a pair of uh, his dad's shoes that were worn out. The leather was worn out in a certain way. And it, and I couldn't figure out why, why did the leather wear out in this unusual pattern? So we looked at them and started to figure out, well, it comes from stepping on the gas pedal over and over and over. And, and then why, why did the snow melt on this side of the building, but not that? Why is there more snow here than there? Who made those tracks in the snow? It was just fun. Uh, uh, just fun to uh, look at the world, the mysteries in the world, and, and yeah. try to figure them out. Well, that's what, and then it made uh, fake uh, murder mysteries. It made it normal. Well, yeah, <laughs> so, we, we so, have to set up our own crime I since thought, then. <laughs> right, I thought I was like, well, this is how every kid's uh, raised. <laughs> and then <laughs> you find out later that's not true. Well, I thought that was what every mother was doing. I, I didn't know any better. It was my well, first time being a mother. Margie, where did that like passion for detection come from? And and why was that like your your go-to way of uh, occupying your son? I, I don't know exactly, but if I look back, uh, I remember reading, uh, I, I, it was hard for me to get my hands on books when I was young. I grew up on a dairy farm in the 40s and 50s. And it was hard to get my hand on, hands on books, but I came across one. Every book was important then. I came across one, opened it, and read a story called The Speckled Band by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And it was my first mystery story. And I had a register in my room, just like the one that was in the story. And uh, being on uh, on a farm in the Midwest, there were snakes everywhere. Blue racers chased you on your bike, that kind of thing. And uh, so the story really resonated. It scared the wits out of me, but I loved it. And and I loved the deduction. Mm. And I think because there were so many Doyle stories then, there was just no end. And that just launched my interest in detection. Well, that's what I remember you talking about Sherlock Holmes reminded me of when I was a kid. We belonged to the Sherlock Holmes oh. Society too. So we would go, we'd read the, They'd pick the story and you'd read a story. And this, I don't know how old I was. I was probably 12 or something. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you'd read the Sherlock Holmes story and then you'd go to like a pub. And then, and then I was so excited to do it. But I think Mm -hmm. I was excited about root beer and fish and chips, you know? And I was like, I didn't care. That's fine. I'll read the story. Uh, But uh, then I ended up loving Sherlock Holmes too. But it it was, uh, that was like one of the nerdier things Mm -hmm. (laughs) that we did growing up. One of them. Had you or have you collaborated on a story before this one? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Yeah, we, it, it's funny. We were talking this morning and I realized I haven't collaborated on a 
story where I've drawn it. I've I've co-written thing. I co-wrote something with Keanu Reeves, and and then I've co-written stuff with Jeff Lemire and other. Or, and then you hand it off to an artist, but this is the first time where I co-wrote a thing and then I'm drawing it. Um, I've never done that before. So that was interesting. You know, actually, <laughs> actually we did, if you think back, uh, there was a, a time uh, oh, yeah. when, when Matt was maybe in middle school or high school and I could see how his art was developing and not just how good it was, but his a deep interest in, in art and, and stories. And I thought that, he, he needed to get noticed. And uh, so I, I wrote a, a, a children's story so that he could illustrate it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we, we put it out there. And yeah. I, I think that one of the letters was, there are already too many stories with mice in them as characters, something yeah. like that. Also, let's be, the art wasn't quite there yet. Oh, oh uh, <laughs> I, I, You'll disagree with that. The art wasn't there yet. Yeah, <laughs> I can, I, I'm objective about it. I, I think <laughs> they're, they're beautiful books. But, but, uh, so so that was really our first collaboration. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I, I think a, a need to see how, how do you get someone up and coming noticed. I remember being a child and I, I, wa I was really into coloring at the time. I was never a good artist, but I wanted to color my favorite comic book characters. And so my mom would actually illustrate uh, like a uh, uh, black and white venom uh, or uh, Colossus. And then I would go in and color in between her lines. And uh, I had not thought about that until I read the press release for this book. So it was a great memory to revisit. That's amazing. That's I would love to see your mom's drawing of venom. Yeah. <laughs> I have it somewhere. I got to track it down. I well, got to track it down. Next, to find, yeah. next, next time we want to see next it. Next time we want to see it. <laughs> okay. It's a mission. I got to go to my parents' basement and start digging. <laughs> They'll be glad to have you take away anything that you will. Oh, that's a sore spot. You are so true. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm... I'm 44 now, and I still have stuff at my parents' house that they still bring up. Uh, I was like, ah, I'll get to it. Um, <laughs> how did then this project come into fruition? Well, we, should I start? Yeah, you go oh, ahead. Okay, uh, we, we get together uh, once a week for a little family dinner, and we we uh, try to one up each other on who who has the most grisly murder that they read about, or who watched the most exciting trial where the defendant took the stand, and and uh, and we also uh, like to watch some of the the television programs like only only murders, murders in the, in the building. building, yeah. yeah. And uh, we were all trying to predict how the first season would end, and I um, had a prediction that wasn't right, but Matt liked it better than the one that actually well, unfolded. Here's a, she, you had figured it all out and oh. she, had a, she had a board and everything with the uh, strings. Well, and, you have to have and, all that. Yeah, she, but, and I was like, I'm just watching it casually. I was like, oh, I can't wait to see. I don't try to figure things out either. I want to just have it. Uh, but same. She came up with a twist for for it. I was like, well, that's that's genius. I can't believe, like the show is fun. I don't know if you've seen it. The show oh, I love it. We, really I mean, fun. Lisa and I love it. Yeah. 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 I love all the cast and everything. We, we, it's so fun. Uh, but what she came up with was such a smart t uh, twist on the whole that changed everything about it. And I was like, if they don't do that kind of twist, I was like, we need to, we just need to write a story together or do mm. something that has a similar, uh, not the story's different, the care everything's different about it, but there was like a, t a twist on the thing that I was like, that's so smart. Um, but then, so at the end of the season, I was I was both hoping, I was like, oh, I hope they, I hope that's what they do, because then this show's like the best show ever. And then if they don't do it, I'll be disappointed. And they didn't do it, and I was disappointed. <laughs> still fun. We're still, season three it was really funny, and, and uh, they didn't do it. But uh, after that, I was like, well, let's do, okay, how can we take something like that and make it a our own thing and populate it with our own characters. And we just basically, we cast ourselves well, as the main characters. Matt said, Mom, we ought, to write, we ought to write a mystery together. And I yeah. said, well, I have three of them on the shelf. Uh, I uh, uh, started writing to publish about, oh, well, about 25 years ago now. And, um, and I, I usually write nonfiction, but there was a time where I really needed some cheering up. And so I thought, I'm just going to put the nonfiction aside and the research and all that and just do something for fun. And so I wrote, uh, ended up writing three mysteries. 
and I put them on the shelf 20 years ago and forgot about them because they were really just for fun. Mm. And then Matt mentioned that I took them down and, and, and thought maybe there's something to start with here. And so th there were some, uh, I think, some seeds that, that were a good starting point for us. But um, then, of course, Matt added uh, characters and, and then that led to different twists. And so th they're really different stories, although they started there. Yeah, well, you had a great, you had great plots already. It's plots that to me um, is the most boring part of the, oh. I don't care about the plot. I don't care about the plot. Oh, I do. I care. I know, so, which so is great. A good team. That's why we're a good team. She had the plot. She had it all that figured out. I was like, oh, that's good. And I, I, uh, I just try to add the spice. <laughs> you know, oh. It's like, let's let's make them go to Paris. Let's have. Can we introduce? Uh, 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 what are some of the things that I put in there? Assassins and oh, and uh, oh. maybe an assassin. That might be a, a red herring, but. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> and, yeah. And gun runners, and, <laughs> yeah. art, art forgers, yeah, the, the whole the whole mix. Yeah, there's a, a criminal artist troupe is one of the yeah. things that, yeah. that has no business being in there. But I thought so. She she let me shoehorn some things into it. <laughs> oh, oh, not, not only let you, but but I was happy to follow his lead. I, I feel like uh, I'm starting at the very top here by working with Matt. I uh, I was you know very uh, pleased to to uh, take what I had and then follow his lead. And there's nobody, there's not a better hype, hype man than your mom. <laughs> I don't know about you or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but I think I'm pretty blunt too. I no, think no, I, it's I, true. This... He, we, uh, yeah, we come from a family where I've gotten four out of five star reviews on Amazon from family members. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if, if she's saying it, it's true. You didn't give me the four star review. Yeah. I don't, no, no, don't I don't make I, it. I, well, <laughs> if, if I, if I, but I would give you an honest review, I, I may yeah. not make it. I wouldn't say it in public. public. Yeah. yeah. I, I'd help you get it up to the five star review yeah, thank and, you. Then, and then give you them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't worry. I uh, made both my mom and dad and my in laws uh, review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. So, you know, they, oh, they, they? Yeah. And I told them they had to do five stars. They could write whatever they wanted, but it had to be five right, right. stars. <laughs> it could be a scathing review, but five stars. Five stars. <laughs> um, I would love to talk a little bit about the process again, like looking at the press release you talk a little bit about how you would sit across from each other and just shout dialogue at each other and then have to remember oh we got to write this down actually um how did that become the system that was i'll say it goes back to uh working on berserker of all things with keanu um when i was co-writing that with him he uh i hadn't done anything like that before so we were trying to figure out how it works and then we sort of settled into this this role where he's 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 obviously the main character that was his person right so he's working that person and then i'm like well who's what, what am i doing so i just populate it with my characters and and so then we would bounce off of each other um so and i think that process taught me i was like well this is how you this is how you can co-write something literally together mm -hmm. um in the same room and it makes it more uh i feel like it makes it more dynamic or more um more real where your your character you tell me what your character says and then i'm like well this is how this is how my character would respond and it's like it's a role-playing game which i never played role-playing games growing up really but um i had friends that had friends that did <laughs> <laughs> and uh but that's what uh, so i think we i learned it from that and i thought well this is how we can do it but we sort of settled into the same mm -hmm. the same mode you know? mm -hmm. yeah i think we you know we each took a character we could identify with uh there are two main characters he took one I took the other it's a a, a great aunt yeah. and uh and her great nephew that's the relationship there and I think that I, I know speaking for myself when I was I, I took on uh, Mary's persona I tried to think well what would I do if I had her guts and mm. so that's uh how she how she came to be yeah and then uh yeah and my character is just like <laughs> It's really a younger version of me, like the youngest, uh, maybe like a worse version of me. <laughs> but, but uh, well, I notice you're wearing a floral shirt, uh, yeah. and uh, floral shirts don't always make uh, Aunt Mary happy. <laughs> That's what I wore this today. Did I? I wore this subconsciously to troll troll my, my yeah, mom yeah. today. <laughs> it, it isn't that it isn't that she objects to Aloha shirts, just not at the dinner table. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that that's now there's a gag at the beginning where 
uh, she's like, no Aloha shirts for dinner. And then he shows up with a t-shirt that says Aloha on it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, uh, I realized later, I was like, where's that? I was like, I actually have that shirt. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so uh, reality yeah. and, and uh, fiction definitely got uh, mixed and, up. And you can wear it to dinner any time. Yeah, I don't like <laughs> I feel like um, the process that you have landed on in, in writing and collaborating sounds like a lot like improv, uh, but that's a, a, a very particular skill uh, apart from just simple writing. Um, can you talk a little bit about making sure that uh, you were on the mission of the story when you were in that process? Yeah, I think I think we definitely we started with an outline and we had the plot. Mm -hmm. So we have here's our signposts, and it's it's almost like anything you write. You know, you have you have to know where you're going or where you're trying to get to, mm -hmm. but then then you have those little frameworks within that. It's like okay, we have this opening scene. What are they? What are they saying? You know, how, what are they? We know they have to talk about this. You know, how how do they talk about it? Mm -hmm. And then you sort of yeah. And it's but don't you feel? I wonder how you feel about this, but all writing is improv to me. Like mm -hmm. you, when you sit down with an empty page, you're it's improv. The whatever you first write, that's improv. You know, and every mm -hmm. everything the first time you put it down is improv, and then the writing part is the going back through it. Um, and refining it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, you know, I think we knew that we wanted to get from here, from here to here. Uh, but then uh, there were twists along the way too. that, oh, mm -hmm. you know, th th this, it might be more interesting to take it this way. So I think, I think we thought that we had a good solid plot, but it was also open to uh, innovation and uh, development as, as we went along. Yeah. Oh, I do remember. I remember we started out with, uh, we had an openings scene I think and then I started to get uh paranoid about it. I was like well this is a murder it has to start out with something uh awful yeah <laughs> it's a comic so, book right so I'm I'm so. constantly like how can we like make it spicier you know and it's like well it needs yeah it needs to have something awful at the beginning mm -hmm. to and so then we would just kind we of would go back the, and the, yeah we moved it around the uh the, the flow of it yeah so you get a murder right we don't want to make you wait for a murder <laughs> yeah, I mean, the structure of the comic is actually really interesting because it does hop around a timeline uh, quite a bit for these characters. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's what I, I we were talking about it again this morning. And I thought there's a paranoia that I get when I'm because it takes so long to draw and then to paint and everything. And and we, we can talk more about my mom's helping paint it, the book, too. She's she's taking some watercolor classes. You're, well, I'm, I'm, doing, artistic. I'm doing basic. Yeah. Flesh. And then he comes in with the shadow and the on the faces and the but, art, art. Excellent. So I'm getting help on that end. Um, but uh, yeah, I start to get paranoid as I'm working on it because you're just focused on. You even said this last night. You're like, she, my mom was. You were painting the, uh, the one scene where it's an interview. It's just the hair. Yeah, and, and she got sick of this character. <laughs> I thought, or, like you kept painting, you know, her face, her arms, her legs, over and over and yeah. over. And I thought well, you had to get really tired of drawing it. If I'm tired of painting, yeah. Her. So she was telling me that I was like, yeah, for the whole book, I'm. And then you just get paranoid about: it. is this any good? And what's is this boring? And it's oh. you're like watching a movie in slow motion, you know. And then, uh, but then I think I was like, we get to the third issue, and there's some there's some third third issue uh, reveals with character and different things uh, that are they're kind of I feel like they take a little bit of a darker twist or there's it gives the characters uh, meat or or like meaning and I was like oh well, this is this is the the way we end it um, makes the whole thing worth worth it to me um, makes the mm. characters worth reading about <laughs> without so spoiling it it's hard, hard to talk about without spoiling yeah yeah you know which which is why we're talking process and i don't yeah. want to get too much into uh <laughs> the the plot of everything at the moment but you touched on something there a little bit the challenges of collaborating together a mother and a son um can you elaborate what you know were there difficulties in this creative relationship I, I would say that if we thought there were going to be serious differences or difficulties, we would never have ventured into it. But then there are always things uh, unforeseen, uh, but but small things. I, I, I Answer the way I uh, told you to, Mom. Uh, Remember uh, our answer. As I said, <laughs> I, I feel like I've started at the top. I, I, would, uh, I think I would be foolish not to follow Matt's lead. 
uh, on, on this whole process. However, um, we, we do have a little bit different perspective. We were talking uh, this morning about how the book is really based on some historic facts and they weave into the story. And uh, his perspective is that you can take the story and do whatever you want with it. And that's my perspective too, except that uh, there was one scene where uh, one, one of the real historic characters is in a panel and she had on something that would never have been worn by a woman in her era. And I said, Matt, that uh, she might have worn that in the evening if she was staring, but a woman would never wear that during the day when she had to be covered and have a hat on if she went outside. And, uh, and he knew that he would have to redraw it. And I understand that's a problem. But I also understand that when I give my friends this book, they're going to say, you got that wrong. That they're going to be looking at the, the history uh, part of it. And, uh, and and I didn't, they'll, they'll forget about the character in the plot. They'll just tell me, you got that wrong. And so I, I said, that needs to be changed. And he, he didn't want to. And I said, well, that's, that's fine. You don't have to, but it's, but it's wrong. And then he said, "Well, show me, did, show me some pictures." How did you know? It. How did you know I didn't want to? I thought I, I thought I hid that. Because I, because I, I had to hid that part. And, and, and so, <laughs> so he said, "Well, show me some pictures of what it should be then." And I said, "Well, I have a couple thousand because I've studied this <laughs> this period of history." And uh, so I showed him what a woman would typically wear. He changed it, and we're good. Yeah, it. it I, my perspective is it's a uh, it's a comic book, so it's all fiction. So you can do whatever you want, you know. And then. Uh, but then from your perspective, it, there is a part of it that's like a, it's a true crime that happened in 1904 World's Fair. We can spoil a little bit of it. It's like a jewel heist that really happened. And uh, and so uh, you were the expert on that part of it. I was like, well, just tell me what happened. What? And then I was like, uh, just adapting it. Um, but then I, I made the character. I gave her, It's comic books. So I gave her like almost like a superhero version of a 1904. She had like this cat oh, yeah. mask on and everything. And then uh, and then you were like, mm, that's. Well, it's too sexy for the era. <laughs> I was like, what? it's a comic book. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah. But then you said that about your friends, and I was like, oh, well, I have, I have friends like that too. But they're they're more like, well, if Superman flew to Krypton, how could he get back in time if he's flying at this speed? You know, I was like, I was like, oh, I get it, I get it. I have those, I have those readers too. <laughs> they're just a different. Yeah. It, it, my, my generation didn't grow up with graphic novels, and uh, they really haven't uh, taken to them. And so uh, this is really quite new, I think. Yeah, yeah. that's what I feel like. Uh, the, for me, the fun of this book, too, is is uh, I can reach my audience, right? But I've, I, I want to reach, forget the kids. I don't care if the kids read comics anymore, but let's get people <laughs> my mom's age to read comics, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I've been trying to do that for 44 years. Um, yeah. You know, good luck to you. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so um, I had a thought and then it just flew right out of my head. Oh, you know, the story begins and we learn that, uh, you know, Aunt Mary and Sammy have um, been involved in several mysteries and have had many successes solving various types of crimes. So I imagine there is a future where we could see more stories, sequels, prequels, sidequels uh, to this one. Do you imagine a larger world beyond this three issue series? Well, that's interesting that you bring that up because uh, a couple of months ago when I brought it up, uh, Matt was sitting across our, our partner table and he was drawing away and I had a few minutes to just uh, think. And I said, oh, I said, you know, in, in, in the second book, we can do this. And and he put down his pencil in the second, second book. It was the wrong time to bring it up. And I said, oh, well, never mind. I can just go ahead and, you know, I'll, I'll just do that for my own fun. Never mind about that. But yeah, I it was <laughs> in the middle of 180 pages. Uh, I was like, the last thing I want to hear about is book two, <laughs> book two and three. When you're like, having to redraw the woman's dress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was like, this is a, uh, but I, no, uh, luckily, Charlene, my wife, is like, don't. She's like, don't boss, don't oh. boss your mom around. Yeah, be oh. be good. <laughs> that 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 was my so, favorite line over dinner. Uh, his wife would nudge and say, "Now, Maddie, don't push your mother around." <laughs> yeah, so I was. Uh, yeah, boy, it sounds. I'm the difficult one. <laughs> I'm realizing now I'm the difficult one. I think I've. Uh, 
No, I always feel like I'm the most affable, but that's probably not yeah. true. No, no, it is but, true. It is true. We, we we wouldn't have gotten into this if we didn't think we could see it through. No, we. Well, I started watercoloring now, so I was like, that's that's the light at the end of the tunnel part. Mm. So yeah. then I'm like, yeah, book two. So we have an idea for a, like kind of a, where you see these characters sort of change across mm -hmm. the three arcs, and it makes it sort of this bigger thing. So the book will, all the books will work on their own, and this book works on its own. But I think there's something more interesting we could do uh, mm. with more books. Mm -hmm. Margie, have you been bitten by the comic bug? Uh, do you need Matt to make more comics now, or can you go off and find <laughs> another collaborator? Well, I, I, I could never, I, I would never uh, go on without him. You know, I, I have the best partner in the world. But uh, I was bitten by the comic bug when I was very young because I grew up on a dairy farm, isolated, and whenever we went to town, it was pretty exciting. And there was a, a J.J. Newberry 5 and 10 store with a whole wall of comic books. And my grandmother gave me a dime. I could get one, and there was Little Lulu every month. And so uh, I grew up with Little Lulu. And if I could finagle another dime out of my grandmother, I would look for, uh, I guess it was a Scrooge McDuck that had the Beagle Boys. I don't know if you know the Beagle Boys or not. I love the Beagle Boys. And uh, so I, I just grew up, with, grew up with them. And then um, I, I guess as I grew older, I, I uh, grew out of them. But then when Matt came along and had such interest in, uh, in uh, comic book conventions, I got right back into it again. I could understand his fascination with it, with it. Yeah, no, I was lucky growing up. We, because I, well, my my older brother, uh, he was in the comics, so I was like, "What are comics?" And then I, and then uh, I got hooked onto those. But then we would go. He would take us. There was a little comic book convention that was in a strip mall, not in the strip mall, but in the basement mm -hmm. of the strip mall was this little comic show in Kansas City, um, and we'd go there. It was just dealers with comics, and there'd be a few few creators here or there. Um, it was always on Mother's Day. I was like, well, it's the worst day for a kid to have oh. a comic book convention. But, but uh, not not for this family. Yeah, yeah, yeah luckily. It, it, every, you were it, raised right. It was on Mother's <laughs> Day, but they, they they wisely gave us a, a coronation, gave all the mothers a coronation at the door. So we, you know, we were sold then. Uh, but it was fascinating watching Matt make his selections and what he liked and what he didn't. And then he started talking or observing and I think asking a question or two of some of the artists who were there. And so I knew that then that this was uh, something that we needed to offer to him, uh, you know, that that experience of of that world, and and so it was great fun for everybody. Yeah. Every, everybody enjoyed it. I, I wasn't oh. giving up anything. I was enjoying it too. And and Margie, when Matt starts making comics, are you keeping up? Are you reading all of his comics? Because it's a lot. You know, I I, I, tr I try. I try. I try to. I can't say that I've read every one. But I try to, what, what I started doing though now is looking more carefully at the art than I ever did before. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I pick up a book like that and I, I want the story and, and I'll, I'll turn the pages and, and race through a book. Now I'm going back and not even looking at the words, just looking at the art. Because when I was uh, helping him do some of the watercoloring, I noticed the detail that, uh, that I never imagined was there until I started to paint. And then I noticed detail that I think will be lost when the pages are shrunk down. And so I thought, well, you know, here is, uh, I, I think, you know, such, um, uh, you know, amazing panels that uh, I've not appreciated mm. and fully until now. So, so now there's I'm some... going to go back to every book. And no, there's some, books, there's some books I don't want you to read. So that, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to read it this, all. Yeah. Uh, just the ones I give you. Just that, that. Agreed. <laughs> well, I'm super excited for the series. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'm desperate for the second issue already. The first issue is not even out, uh, but the the first issue leads ends with s such a wonderful. Um, cliffhanger uh, i need that second issue and we will need to have you both back on and have lisa join in on that conversation so we can go a little bit more deeper into the themes and characters and spoilers of the series yeah no let's do that it will uh we'll make sure you get the whole thing and then we can talk about uh talk about the ending <laughs> yes yes i gotta know that ending we gotta talk how it relates to only murders in the building yeah <laughs> all right uh thank you so much have a wonderful day yeah thanks thank take you. care you too 
Lisa, listening to that interview, which I know you did on your car ride home from work yesterday, uh, aren't you so sad you missed out? I like, am. I, I know. Am. I know you couldn't do it. You literally could I not do it. Physically could not do it. But man, it was such a good chat with Matt and Margie, and such a good chat for you. Yeah, and I'm. There's still so many things you did a great job. Thank there you. are still so many things I am so curious about. Yeah, and I knew that like the conversation I was having with them was a conversation that would not have happened if you were there. Like right. we would have just had something totally different. Um, I think that what we got was great. Like I love these two so much, but I'm really excited about getting them back on the show so we can have that full spoilers conversation about guilt frame. So you talked about how your mom would draw pictures for you yeah. to color, and yeah. that was one of the ways you occupied your time. My mom would do the same kind of thing you know where we would both sit together and we would both be using crayons and pencils and that whole thing but like margie's impulse to collaborate where she's like my son is talented he seems to be moving in a direction he should be illustrating children's books i'm going to write a children's book and we're going to submit it for publication and like where i i go like that is a step beyond <laughs> that yeah. is something my parents wouldn't do like i was obviously a creative little kid and they found it really entertaining and they put me in lessons and that kind of thing but they were never like okay you know they were never the like let's take my kid to an audition or, or like you know whatever yeah, I, we've, but, I think we've talked about this in the past but your parents and my parents were very similar in that fashion in the sense that becoming a creative person in a real way was a fantasy was uh, impossible yeah. there was no access to people who were actually doing it therefore it could not be done by quote unquote normal people yeah and i would never say that they actively discouraged me no no you know? same like same. I, I still they paid for my education and i majored in music right right but my parents and i think your parents just didn't know what the next step was beyond like okay you're talented and we are going to support that talent right right right, right. Yeah. yeah so yeah, they left it to the professionals yeah and and i just think that it's really interesting it's just a completely different approach to go like okay well i'll be your collaborator yeah. and i i really do like how kiana reeves hovers above this collaboration mm -hmm. you know matt kent because of his collaboration with Keanu Reeves on Berserker, he found a way, a method that he could then apply to his collaboration with his mom. You know, so he took what he learned from his Berserker experience and then brought it to Guilt Frame. And we have this beautiful comic as yeah. like a spiritual creative sequel to Berserker. So cool. Another thing that stands out comparing the Phillips conversation to the Kint conversation is that there is no power imbalance there, or if there is a power imbalance, it like tips towards Matt. It oh, tips mm -hmm. towards the child to the point where like um, Margie is a Nepo mommy. Like she wouldn't <laughs> be in comics if it wasn't for Matt. <laughs> well, yeah. And that's just like so cool. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, it is really fun, as you were saying in the intro, to listen to the Jacob Phillips, Sean Phillips conversation and then listen to the Matt Kent, Margie Craft Kent conversation. Mm -hmm. They're in conversation with each other, uh, but in surprising ways. But I like to me, the lesson is like every collaboration is going to be different and every day is going to be different. And all you have to do is like be open to making a thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And remember that there is no better hype man than your mom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just the other day, we were uh, posting things on Facebook, and one of the things had only two likes, and it was from Leo, my dad, and Greg, your dad. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. Yeah, dads can be pretty good hype men as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was the uh, best comics of the year so far article. Which has gotten a lot of love other oh, places. It's doing great on the <laughs> website, and there's a link in the show notes. I would love every listener to go click on it and take a look at our favorite 30, our 30 favorite books of the year so far. 2024 has been such an incredible year. 
here. But it was funny to me that the only people on Facebook who had liked it on the Comic Book Couples Counseling page at the time was Leo and Greg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're very, they're very supportive. They give those yeah, likes freely. Yeah. As we were just saying, very supportive parents, very supportive. Uh, Lisa, that is going to do it for this week's episode. Who are we talking to next week? We are talking to the cartoonist behind what is currently our favorite book of the year. We are talking to Maurice Velicoup. It is his memoir entitled, I'm So Glad We Had This Time Together. And this book is extraordinarily special. You need to get it in your hands like right now. It's a crushingly beautiful work. It's from Pantheon Books. It is a big 500 page memoir. It took him 11 years to complete. Uh, please go read this book and come back next week for our conversation with Maurice Velacoupe. I think it's uh, you know one of the best conversations that we've had this year. Um, he was so open with us. Yeah. This memoir goes some really private, uncomfortable places. Yeah. And uh, we had to go there with our questions, and he was just a dream, like, a dream person. I, I, I think it's a heroic work of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that I don't think... I could possibly do with my own life. Uh, even though we just sort of tried to attempt it yeah, with ours our is story. Such, <laughs> such the, 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 the smallest nod in a vulnerable direction. <laughs> uh, but we're so proud of it. And again, we're not going to shut up about it. Pots and Panels, it's coming to Kickstarter in October. The story is The Vegetable. The artist is going to be Gerald Von Stoddard. Get hyped. Tell your friends about Pots and Panels. We want this book to do really well. And, you know, we want it to lead to other things. But don't become sick of us because we talk about it all of the time. Please continue to like us. We already mentioned that we posted on the website our best comics of 2024 so far. We named 30 great comics that we've read. Please take a look at that. Link in the show notes. And then next week, we are publishing an article that's basically like the best tips and tricks to surviving the San Diego Comic-Con that is this month. We're just a couple weeks away from SDCC. And we reached out to publicists, writers, podcasters, artists, journalists, all kinds of people to give us their best tips for surviving Comic-Con, and they delivered. We've got folks like Daniel Warren Johnson contributing to this article. We talked to Gail Simone, Heidi McDonald, Greg Katzman from IDW. Uh, I, I'm really excited about this article. And this has been such a fun process, yeah, and getting I think all of these quotes. It will apply to other large conventions. Yeah. So if you don't go to San Diego Comic-Con, but you go to C2E2, or you go to Heroes Con, or you go to uh, NYCC or Baltimore, these tips will apply to your experiences there as well. Uh, and then on August 18th, the next month, Lisa and I are hosting another comic book film club at the Alamo Draft House in Winchester, Virginia. This month or next month, we will be showing Atomic Blonde. Yes, and it is Brad's birthday. Yeah. Gifts not required. But I would love it. Who? I've never been a person to turn down a gift, and Brad isn't either. And Just, I will also be accepting gifts. That went weird, but... <laughs> It's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a good comics recommendation for my birthday. I would love that. Okay, Brad, it's time to wrap up this conversation because I want to get back to eating my escargot. I'm determined <laughs> to like every food. Oh, yeah? How's that going for you? Meh. Where oh. can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? That's a very inside joke. <laughs> Back to you, but not related to our fight in Portland. Back to you. Uh, you can find me on most social medias at MouthDork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show poster, send them to Karen Chap at Karen underscore X-Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I'm always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Spotify, YouTube, Audible, Apple Podcasts, or whatever app you choose. We are everywhere. If you'd like to get exclusive, Ooh. you can join our Patreon where you get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. And the script to our new comic book. Yeah, that's right. A uh, comic book. 
a comic story. Comics, <laughs> we are really it's blowing seven pages. this out of proportion. It's seven pages, everyone. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on all the socials at CBCC Podcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts, and if you'd like to do an act of service, why not write a review of the show while you're there? Yes, please. We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So, until next time, friends, keep your love tank full and your psychic rapport open. So should we tell them what we were fighting about in Portland? Yes, we were fighting about. So Brad was like, it's your turn to choose a restaurant. Uh, uh, yeah. And we were walking around Portland. Yeah, because I, because the, the day before I had chosen the restaurant. Right. And you're not a fan of lobster rolls. No. Brad's a huge fan of lobster rolls. And I went to a place that was a lobster roll place. Yeah. And I ended up eating a collection of sides that was delicious and perfectly fine. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, we were walking around Portland and I would say like, how about this place? And then Brad would go like, but is this really what you want? Is this really what you want? <laughs> I just didn't believe you. I knew you didn't want this place. You wanted something, you know, hip and cool and vegan. Yeah, but there was no, like there was probably such a place, but we were not going to find it by walking and you were being a troll. Yeah, and, I, I mean, yes. So eventually you snapped at me. I you, did. you snapped at me because I was being, I was going to say passive aggressive, but maybe I had gotten to the point of being aggressive aggressive where I was doubting your own uh, you, words. And you were getting so frustrated. I was getting frustrated and you were getting frustrated and then then we were fighting on the street. And, you know, like Portland's like a cool, hip college. I don't know. Is it a college town? But it's like know. a it young seems, town, right? We saw young people and we we're like, lot they of, must live here. Right. A lot of young people. And there was like a, 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 a gentleman who was collecting money of some kind. Yeah, or charity. Signatures. And he came up to us. I was like, excuse me, do you have a moment? And I was like, no, my wife and I are fighting. Yes. <laughs> and Lisa was like, yeah. uh, what did you say to him? I said, I, I said, yes, that is true. We're in an argument. And then he said. He said, do you know what could fix it? He said, he says, you know what could fix that? A child. And I laughed in his face. It, it's because it was one of those charities where it's like for 25 cents a day, you, you can, can help adopt a, a kid. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Not and adopt, but you know, it, feed a child. The, 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 like that was such a funny moment that it kind of like took me out of my own, like seething red at the time. Yeah. And, you know, we talked it out. We, we we ultimately said, like, well, there's nothing for us here in Portland. And then we drove back to New Hampshire. It was also, like, 3 o'clock. So a, a lot of things were just closed. Yeah. Uh, and on the way back to New Hampshire, by, like, by like 15 minutes back on the road, we were totally yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. That, that is what a Brad and Lisa argument is like. Yeah. There you go. Bye. See you next week. Bye.